Share Shootout brought to you by Lion of Africa Insurance, ensuring South Africa's future. Match Day 11 on the most vicious stock picking show on television. Good evening, I'm Bruce Whitfield. Welcome to Share Shootout League right here on CNBC Africa. First in business worldwide. Now, was there a headcount before the World Pension Summit decided on Nigeria as hosts? And what is a World Cup semi-final without England? And who will be the real money winner of the World Cup? Now, we don't know the answers to any of these vexing questions. What we do know is Sasha, the hashtag Bucks, is making a charge. You can see how Twitter decided over the course of the week. Bucks has managed to narrow Gary running dog's lead. And for the Scott, unfortunately, you need more Twitter friends. That's the tragic reality. Right, for Match Day 11, we have a guy who wants three points and another guy who desperately needs them to appreciate their desperate positions. One just has to look Look at how the league has unfolded and they won't be on the first slide unfortunately as you can see Gary the running dog was leading the pack but opening up quite a big gap of six points with his closest rival on three points but at the bottom you've got Nao the one on zero and Leven on zero as well Leven's playing tonight he desperately needs your assistance this evening remember you decide who wins this match and ultimately who wins the league you follow at SSO League on Twitter you tweet any of the stock pickers hashtags we don't ask why you vote we just count them so that absolves us of any responsibility back to the game of hand he knows how to dress but will his stock picks impress it's easy when you do it live because then you just keep flowing eh? my name's Levin Gopal uh, I'm uh, the CIO with Trademark Futures because we're a futures trading house, a lot of it is trading uh, single stock futures uh, and the index. We try and be as swift as possible to get in and out of the market. So we look for gaps both up and down uh, to take advantage of these most of our clients. The game plan uh, is a poker game, so you've got to keep a poker face. And uh, we, uh, we're going to be armed with all this uh, knowledge uh, and research and uh, we're going to be playing uh, our strategy very close to our chest. Um, so I think it's mainly uh, a knowledge base more than anything. The biggest competitor has got to be Bruce Whitfield. He's always putting us on the spot and he steals all our limelight. I definitely think we've got a very good chance of winning the game. It's uh, like playing poker. So we've got a very good knowledge uh, of the market, we know all the stats, uh, and we know when to hold them and when to fold them. Well, Levin Gopal is taking out a man who scours the world for value and has never changed tack. Let's check out the guy who calls himself Value Guy. Nick Norman Smith, Chief Investment Officer of Lentis Asset Management. Follow a value investing approach here at Lentis. We generally are quite contra contrarian, so looking for areas of the market that people are really um, hate and, and are, are nervous of, and that's where we believe we can find the opportunity. I think it's about, about finding some, some stocks that the audience really likes, exciting, and try and spice things up a bit and not just have the boring old favorites. I think Bruce Woodfield is definitely going to be uh, the biggest troublemaker on the show. Yeah, absolutely. One must be positive. See, I think it's going to be a, a tough competition, so for sure. Well, both Levin and Nick are chasing after running dog who is at the top of the league and others are further down. But let's first get the house rules out of the way. Both of our stock pickers have pre-picked three shares. Each has got to accept at least one of their competitor stocks. Each has got 30 seconds to argue their stock picks. Not complicated. The voting process, however, is for some of our contestants. Stock pickers can pick from the JSE Top 100. They're limited to one international stock pick per round from international selected global indices. Now that we've got that out of the way, Time to roll up our sleeves and get dirty. I like a man in a tie. I'm going to make him go first, Nick Norman Smith, if that's all right with you. Levin Gopal, tell me why you like this one. Levin Gopal is with Trademark Futures. Um, we saw the nice patch results come out just last week. They were a little on the light side, investing billions in new development, new chief executive on charge, probably the most expensive share on the JAC. You're playing against the value guy. He's going to shoot you down. I don't know why we're wasting the time, but let's do it anyway. 30 seconds. 
on NASPERS. So NASPERS results came to about 2% uh, lower than the previous round. Uh, there was an expectation of even better uh, earnings. The real thrust of the business is its exposure to Asia, uh, with its exposure to China in particular, uh, Russia, as well as uh, new developments in terms of communication and the print business, I believe residual income from TV, all likely to put this uh, on top of your portfolio. Uh, the next set of financials are probably going to bang out the previous. There we go. I think our time is up. Not that I can hear the clock, but I'm sure that the time is up, Levin. Um, it's the one that you've got to shoot down next. Surely, <coughs> surely you must shoot it down. No, absolutely. Uh, I think I, would, I went short this early in, in the show. I mean, 10 cent, so Naspers is on what, 69 times earnings. If you look at the real uh, sort of valuation, 10 cents at uh, close to 50 times earnings. This can be the best business in the world. Uh, paying that for it is, uh, is, just, is just insanity. Justify paying that. So I think there are certain businesses where you want to pull yourself away from price to earning ratios. Uh, we've seen in the past a number of technology businesses blow up. This is quite different because there's genuine revenue that's already being earned. All that we have to do is see the shape of Nasbur's business fall in line with the rest of the population. And they're on track in terms of 10 cents being able to deliver the goods. Nick. Uh, Microsoft earned proper revenue in the early 2000s. So did Intel, so did Cisco, so did Oracle. And they were priced at these kind of multiples. In fact, not even as expensive as these. And they had more robust business models. And you've gone nowhere in them. So and, and, the, and the geography issue here, Levin, I'd like, I'm interested yeah. in your view on this one. They're all right, one and a half billion, or they're about rand in Turkey. Um, they've got Vladimir Putin as president of a country in which they're heavily invested with mail.ru. And he sends intent on starting World War III, if you believe the lunatics. I mean, all of this sort of stuff. And the, the Chinese uh, government are hardly um, completely open and transparent. They yeah. could quite easily shut down some of their big businesses. So I'm not saying any of these are going to happen, but those are huge risks mm. when you're paying this kind of a premium. Over they here. are in extremely risky positions. Not only is there legislative risk in China, but there's also uh, a change of guard in Russia, potential problems in uh, the Middle East, Turkey in particular, where they are. All of this means that they've chosen well because it's risky destinations that are able to deliver good profits. Okay. There is also, I mean, if, if I'm going to go on a tightrope um, and I'm going over Niagara Falls, I want a safety net. There is no safety net. There's uh, so far away. But there's actually spikes. <laughs> there's safety spikes. Yeah. You're shooting it down. Yeah, right, anything goes wrong and you could get seriously hurt from a valuation perspective. I don't care how great the business there is. There we on. go. I'm sorry, Levin. You're shot down on that particular one. But better luck next time. I like the rest of your picks. There's some adventurous ones in there too. But I'm looking forward to seeing whether or not uh, Nick Norman Smith will buy and on which one he will buy it. Nick from Letters Asset Management. Now he has, you using your offshore allowance, you're taking money out of the country at uh, a very high rates uh, to foreign currency. You've got to then take a bet that these companies are going to outperform anything in South Africa. You're in the technology space. I don't know how you see this, but give me the view of Oracle. Oracle in 30 seconds. This is, this is the largest <laughs> enterprise software business. Essentially, they've got around a 50% market share in databases. Very boring, but they handle the data for banks, retailers, insurance companies, basically anything. Um, this is a highly important part of everyone's business. Therefore, they have huge pricing power. So they have power, pricing power despite the fact that they're free alternatives. No one wants to move away from, uh, move their provider in such an important uh, you know, part of their business. That's why they have managed to generate such great margins. Great incentivized management team. CEO earns around a quarter of the company, so he's going to be back. You're back stealing here. time. That is bad. But the CEO earns a quarter of the company, apparently. This is what I heard at the end of time. You should, wait, what do they say in court? Strike you should, you should strike that off the record. Uh, Levin Gopal, you can't argue against Oracle, or can you? I think it's a very good business. I do think that there are a number of competitors within the space. And so because there's ever-changing technology, and the slightest change means that you're faster or cheaper, I think that the space that they play in is probably far too dangerous to have a, a big allocation to this particular stock. It's one that I'd, I believe leave uh, may be valuable in, in a portfolio in a smaller portion. It's not something that uh, I can endorse, so I'm going to shoot it down. You're shooting it down just on that basis. Kaboom, you're gone on Oracle. Uh, I like the Oracle. So now that's any consolation. valuation around, strip out, the, by the way, the $15 billion net cash they have on their balance sheet. It's trading around 12, 13 times earnings, and those are depressed earnings because they are reinvesting into new areas. It is, it is important. Yes, Levin is right. They, they are in an area that can change, but the fact 
that they have such um, high switching costs that even if someone has a better product, they're not going to switch. What they're probably going to do is Oracle's going to buy them and integrate them into their product. And that, and that is the key. That's why this is so much better than so many technology businesses. I think you, I think you could be whistling the Star Spangled Banner right now and live in what you do. Just interesting. Uh, I mean, I, uh, 12 times earnings for an entrenched business like that mm. is risky. 60 times <laughs> in any business that's uh, <laughs> a lot riskier to me. I told you it was mean. I told you it was personal event. But you are shooting him down. I am. It's, it's a technology down. business. And even though my first pick was yeah. technology, the difference is that there is too much of risk with this being locked into one particular yeah, space. That's fair enough. Absolutely. So shot down on both fronts, both of you. Anglo-American, uh, market cap of about 370-odd billion rand. We haven't seen some recent results out of Anglo-American. With the platinum strike, has dra been a drain on Anglo-American. Whether they sell it or not is yet to be seen. But Anglo-American, as a stock pick at this point in a resources down cycle event, you've gone from crazy to courageous. Give us in 30 seconds why you like Anglo. So I like Anglo PLC because because of a very good split between the resources. The income that it has is diverse in a geographical sense. Of course, there's a lot of risk spread between different uh, countries and currencies. Uh, the big uh, income producers uh, account as Kumba Iron Ore and Platts, both of which have been hammered quite badly. We've seen a recent PMI stats out of China showing us that it may not necessarily be the end of the China story. And so I believe that resources may still dominate. Strike Anglo it from the record. Resources may dominate. There we go. Uh, can you argue against uh, Anglo-American? Good valuation. The resources sector is an interesting one. Um, there was a, a report out this week, the new iPhone 6, which is going to be about the size of this thing, um, uh, and, and all that sort of stuff, that uh, Foxconn, the company that is going to be making it, has hired another 100,000 people. I mean, China scales up, scales down like this. The resources story is one that you've got to buy, surely, Nick. It is. Now, I'm always wary of buying stories, but if the story and the price match up, then great. Uh, so, I mean, Anglos has been a pick of mine on the show before. I think it's great. It's trading at close to book value. Um, it's got some great underlying assets, in spe specifically Amplats, yeah. which is significantly undervalued, um, as well as various other. So I'm quite quite scared of the iron ore exposure, yeah. but we have been, and we've been warning about iron ore for a long time, and we've seen what's happened in the price. But despite all of that, it's, it's priced at a, at a cheap enough level that, that one should do quite well out of it. Okay, but are they going to sell Anglo-American Platinum? Do you anticipate that they will? There have been rumors. I, I, it is a little bit concerning for me because they will be selling close to what I believe is close to the bottom of the cycle. Mm. So if they can get a good enough price, fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in a hurry. I think that's one of, uh, one of the uh, assets that I like within Anglo-American. They've got a three-year time. They've got a three-year time frame now in which to work through with you know, sorting out union issues, sorting out mine issues, sorting out uh, government issues as well. Uh, perhaps it would be foolhardy to sell at this particular point. Levin, I think you've been accepted yeah. on Anglo-American. On Anglo-American. There's also uh, quite a big rumor in the market that Anglo PLC itself is ripe for a takeover. Who might take over? Um, I think Glencore is one of those houses that's been tipped and. That's uh, probably one of the reasons that they looked to list on the JSE, uh, or at least that's how the story goes. Right, do, you, do you buy that story, Nick? Uh, perhaps. I mean, they burnt their fingers quite badly, Glencore and Extrata. I mean, they've already mm. written off sort of $8 billion. Um, but, but who knows? Uh, Ivan Glasberg's got a big appetite for risk and, and a big ego. So and if you're a South African, what do you want to own more than anything else? With South Africa with a mining past and a mining history, you want to own Anglos. Yeah. You want to turn, show Oxbridge what you're made of. Um, yeah, I think it's an, interesting, it's an interesting possibility. It's an interesting punt. It's been accepted. Levent, Anglo-American getting the thumbs up. Nick, I look at your second pick, and it is also courageous. It is international. The owner of the world's second biggest retailer, um, and that, of course, is Conformarama. It's a French company. It's owned by those nice people from Stellenbosch called Steinhoff. In 30 seconds, tell me why you like it. Yeah, so effectively the second biggest furniture retailer behind uh, IKEA. Um, this was bought uh, in 2011 when no one wanted to touch Europe, and this has been a trademark of Marcus Eusta, um, a very astute dealmaker. And they own a lot of very valuable property in Europe, which gives it a great underpin. A valuation, the stock is up around 100% in, in the last while. Um, we've liked it all the way from back then, and we still like it now. Um, trading on around 12 times earnings, and those are quite depressed earnings given the situation in Europe. Plus, this gives them scale. Scale is huge in retail, and adding it to the existing businesses uh, puts them in a good footing. Uh, but I 
I look at Europe and I, I look at the data coming out of Europe, Levin, and I, if I wasn't a more courageous individual, I'd be absolutely petrified of uh, what Europe's growth opportunities are over the next 20 or 30 years. So I believe that Europe has still got a huge uh, potential for growth. It's not an immediate uh, uh, income producer for uh, b players within the retail space. I'd be very cautious uh, to have extended uh, exposure to Europe. I'd look at emerging markets, and I think a number of the European stocks themselves are feeling very tired. So whichever sector you look at, and this is shooting down not just retail, but I'm shooting down an entire continent. <laughs> <laughs> I think you. <laughs> I think people Europe have tried this before, and it's ended badly. I it's think, I think Europe is probably the worst place to be doing business right now, with all sorts of potential that exists everywhere else in the world. We saw and the European Central Bank cut interest rates from nothing to even less. Uh, and it just, it's got to exemplify just how deadly concerned they are about, uh, about the growth process. And exactly, and, and this is not a lone view. Therefore, uh, the most of it is probably in the price, and that's why you can buy such great assets at, at such a reasonable valuation. So uh, I'll give the valuation point rather than trying to blow up an entire continent. <laughs> uh, from a valuation point of view, I think it's uh, very much entrenched uh, with the population, the spending power. It's now a continent of people who have no savings, who have no income, uh, and have limited jobs. So European ninjas, I don't think, will be spending a lot of money but uh, on the retail even, side. Even if you believe that, that they are in the doldrums for the next 20 years, people still need to buy couches and beds and furniture, but they're going to buy low end, and Conferama serves that perfectly. So a, a compelling argument, but you've been shot down. He doesn't believe you, he doesn't believe you, and no matter how hard you try, he doesn't believe you. He's shooting you down on Steinhoff. Hey, it's a nice fight, and it's getting quite personal. Who will reign and who will be really in pain who will thrive and who will be lucky to survive will it be the value guy or the good guy you decide by following at sso league you use your power to decide fundamentally it doesn't matter what we say i'll review their stock picks Welcome back, you're watching Share Shootout League, the only league without players apparel. Well, that's what we thought until a moment ago because we were too cool for school. And then Bob the Builder joined us on set. This is match day 11. Yes, that is Bob the Builder. Yes, well, you this can. is my Anglo's hat. No, you look like Bob the Builder, I'm afraid. You're not. You're at the bottom of the league and you're thinking, can I move up that <laughs> league? And you're thinking, yes, I can. Bob the Builder is taking on, of course, um, the value guy. The good guy is Levin Gopal, who is pretending to be an Anglo-American miner when, in fact, he really looks like like Bob the Builder. He's taking on Nick Norman Smith, of course, the value guy. Who should stay and who should go? Who's got the best dress sense on the day? You follow at Share Shootout League and you vote. Let's have a look at what they've chosen so far. Bob the Builder has chosen Nussbat. He's gone long on Nussbat, but he's been obliterated on Nussbat. Um, Nick Norman Smith laughed out loud almost when, uh, when uh, Levin brought his 500 billion rand company and said, this is what I would like to buy, please. Anglo-American is the other one of Levin Gopal's picks this evening. And and uh, Anglo-American gets his Bob the Builder thumbs up. Uh, it's a terrible shade of yellow. <laughs> and then, of course, Nick uh, Norman Smith from Lintus Asset Management. Oracle uh, getting the thumbs down. And Steinhoff also uh, getting shot down this evening. So he has to go for your final pick. Which is why, Levin, I'm going to leave you to last on this one. Because I'm interested to see what Nick Norman Smith does with your final pick. Let's go to yours, Nick. Because I've just got to get that unsightly canary out of my peripheral vision. Um, Anglo-American Platinum. It's an interesting one. Bottom of the cycle. You should have bought it a week or two ago, I suspect. But why would you buy it now in 30 seconds? It's still, despite the fact that it's up around 80% from its lows a year ago, it's still relatively undervalued. And this is a great commodity, diversified globally, um, diversified amongst uh, industries um, in a sector that everyone hates. And therefore, the, the pricing is right. Platinum is unlikely to go away. And Platts is the biggest producer, produces around 40% of, of new platinum. And um, they've, they've gone through a lot of trouble. This should be a, a slicker machine over time. And, um, and you know, paying these kind of low valuations is the key to successful investing. There we go. You can't argue against that, can you, Bob? I mean, Levin. I accept it. Um, I just would like to include that I think it's in a valuable space for potential takeover. Um, it's well capitalized, well organized, well managed. 
um, all thumbs up for Amplads. Yeah, Amplads, but you see, these platinum producers have got another problem, don't they? They might have a three-year wage deal in place, but it doesn't change the dynamics within an industry which is under severe duress uh, with claims and counterclaims by management and by trade unions as to whether or not job losses have been uh, protected against in the future or not. Uh, management will have an, an ace up their sleeve, no doubt, and the trade unions will feel emboldened by their recent, by their perceived victory anyway, Nick Norman Smith. Yeah, but the key with platinum is even if the costs go up, um, unless it's ludicrous and they find uh, uh, new, you know, new An alternative, alternative yeah. sources, um, which is highly unlikely at the moment, um, the the either production will cut because a lot of the marginal miners will go out and a lot of the smaller guys will, will drop out, or the price will go up and we'll all make money. So that's the difference. If you compare that to gold or iron or, or the other resources, quite frankly, if South Africa's production costs go up, they just don't buy from us and they go elsewhere. But because we control this global supply, that's the key behind the thesis uh, mm, for there we go. And you're accepting it, Levin, so let's, sure. let's move on. Um, I'm interested that he's accepted it because I go on to Levin's last pick, or Bob, as he's now going to be known, um, and you're going to the opposite end of the platinum spectrum. You're sticking with the platinum sector. You're going for the altogether more tricky Impala platinum. Rumour is that it may need to come to market and raise capital in the second sure. half of this year. Why then would you choose that in 30 seconds? So I think Impala's got a nice geographical uh, mix. They've got Zimplatz, uh, they've got Marola, they've got different income uh, production coming through from, uh, so geographical mix, but also it's platinum, palladium and rhodium. Uh, notice that they've also got a fair chunk of nickel in terms of their income. The rhodium element is important because it's already been mooted as a substitute for platinum and so they're able to come to the, uh, to, um, to the party with that. The the need for capital is true, and they're probably going to be successful in their capital raising. The, but but that they'll be successful in their capital raising. But if I buy Impala Platinum shares today, I'm going to have to cough up more later to maintain my stake in the business, Nick Dormans. And, and it's not the greatest time to be raising capital, Bruce, because clearly the share price at 115 Rand, not at you know, 350 where mm. it was not too long ago. So you've got so to issue more shares and dilute your existing shareholders further exactly. to raise the same amount of capital. And unfortunately, these resource companies do it time and time again. They buy back shares at the top and they issue equity at the bottom. I mean, Amplats did a capital raise at, at just over 500 Rand um, a few years ago to shore up their balance sheets, um, looking a little bit stronger now. But yeah, I mean, in, in the interest of the game, I, I've got to shoot it down, but quite frankly, it's, it's in a good sector. Is so it six like of it one and half a dozen of the other? Explain this one to me, please. Because so if, if you're going to go for platinum, does it really matter whether you buy Impala or Anglo Platinum, Nick? We, we actually own both of them, to be honest. Ha, so there we, we go. We, we started with Amplats because that, that mm. was so much cheaper back in the day and, and Impala's been under pressure. So we do, we do like both of them. So you accept it, basically, don't you? I'm shooting it down. I you mean, can't shoot it so down. so much if risk in Zimbabwe. We, uh, so yeah, I think maybe. Uh, yeah, churlish. Yeah. Churlish, churlish, no, churlish. Look, I, I, I think it would be. Uh, you know, I would be lying if, if I said <laughs> to you that I hated it and, and you know, we, we've got a lot of client so capital investment. I like Amplats and I've accepted it. I like Impala a lot more. I think the potential for upside is there. It's not something that you're buying for the next month or six months because it's common cause that the next set of financials are going to be disastrous. They don't have any uh, platinum that they've been uh, able to get out of the ground. So certainly the earnings are not going to be good. But if you buy it for the next three years and you know that you've got this wage deal that has been uh, hammered out. Uh, I Can you trust you the wage deal? I think we have to trust the wage deal. Why there's do we also, have to trust the there's wage also deal? We don't have to do anything of the sort. There's new chapters that are being uh, thought out now that similar to the agricultural uh, joint uh, ownership uh, by workers, that a similar deal may happen within the mining sector. So it makes sense for uh, South African workers to uh, make their companies successful. And you are going to have to pay for that shareholding, as a shareholder, as an existing shareholder, yeah. you will have to fund the sharing out of the spoils. Nothing wrong in principle with doing so, but why do you invest in companies, put your hard-earned capital into companies that are going to have to be diluted over a period of time? I think that the dilution is one element. Remember that Impala has not only uh, done very well with their trading of platinum ETFs, and that was in their financials, uh, not only is it something that has got the potential to deliver, it has the potential 
potential to take advantage of higher or uh, higher metal prices, uh, more so than let's say amplifiers. But why is the metal price going to move? The world is not consuming as much platinum as it was. There is a huge recycling yeah. of platinum because that comes with because the, the supply. The there is no way that we're going to have the same amount of supply because, quite frankly, I, I don't care what's been agreed. Workers are going to get fired, and these mines are going to get mechanized because. And this is I've unfortunately, got to agree the, with that unfortunately, the it's situation that the, that the union pipeline. bosses have done. And once again, that's why that's why it's so key. And because someone like Amplatz controls the large vast amount of, of supply, that puts him in a good position. So I have to say, if we, if we're comparing the two. No threat of the capital raise, larger, stronger, more solid in, in what's going to be a very volatile environment. I'm, I'm going to have to shoot down Implats. I'm just so Amplats. happy that I've already got Im Impala and Amplats. I've got the best of both worlds. Uh, but, uh, what, what about the fact that there is going to be a greater sharing of the spoils in South Africa in the next 10 years? Whether you like it as an investor or not, that is a fair complete. Um, black economic empowerment in its current form has not worked. It has not empowered people. It has enriched a small elite. There's, there's going to have to be sharing. Is it worth investing in? It is. That's because you, you're paying a low enough price that it is. So okay. unlike an Aspas or something like that, you're paying a cheap enough price that this is all factored in. These are resource companies. They're in volatile arenas. This is going to happen. If it's not strikes, it's going to be something else. That's the reality. That's why you need to buy them at historically low valuations. And I think that's where we're going to need to leave it. So you've been shot down on that one, Levin, but I think that you won the day despite the silly hat. Uh, remember, these guys need your votes. Levin, more than anyone else. <laughs> Hope you go. And, and help him. Go and support him. Tweet us uh, with his hashtag. We'll be counting the hashtags till midnight on Sunday. Uh, Nick Norman Smith also, he wants to move further up the league tables as well. If you like the fact that he kept a more modest dress sense and made some very compelling arguments with his stock picks this evening of Oracle, Steinhoff and Anglo Platinum, you vote for him. If you preferred Levin's hat and his Nussbash, Anglo American and Impala picks, plus the arguments he made, then you vote for him. It's not that complicated. We need your votes, please. So keep them coming in. We're back again next Tuesday. Half past eight for match day 12, right here on the infernally tough and blatantly brutal, most vicious stock picking show on the small box. Go to at SSO League, check out the players, their profiles, let us know your thoughts. And until next week, stay more cunning than Levens Hat.